I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. These are the stories of the killers and the people who hunt them. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. Are you looking to achieve a measure of personal gain or success? Maybe you're looking for good luck in business. Maybe you have fertility issues. Perhaps you're a politician in search of power or a criminal in search of protection. You want to become invisible to the police or bulletproof like your favorite superhero? Well, guess what? Human Mooty will get you none of that. We're going to talk about it today. My name is Paul Vivian Llewellyn. I'm a journalist curious about Africa's killers, criminals, and the cops who catch them. Joining me to discuss the reality behind crime on the continent once again is Jared Labaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management, check them out online, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Please visit our YouTube page and subscribe. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Simply search Profiler. And you can engage with us on our social media pages, Twitter and Insta. Our handle is at Profiler Africa. And please join the group on Facebook. As always, we're keen to hear your feedback, field your questions, and listen to suggested topics. So please get in touch. And thanks for some great feedback so far. Remember that we will post content on our social pages that relate to the crimes we discuss so that you can better engage with the discussion and see what it is that we are talking about. And today we're talking about a, uh, a subject which is, you know, something that I think we'll, we will all have heard of in South Africa. Um, it's very much one of those, uh, those crimes that is linked to tradition, to culture, to spirituality. And it is Muti murder. Gerard. Where do we start with a conversation on Muti murder? Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think most people in South Africa at least have seen headlines like this in our newspapers from from time to time. Um, and again, it's, it's something that's been around for centuries. It's not new. I think, again, social media and the modern media perhaps brings it up into the spotlight more often and easier than, than in the past. But um, yeah, something that I think we'll, we'll never get rid of, unfortunately. What um, is Muti? Yeah. I mean, obviously the word muti just really just comes from the Zulu word for medicine. So one shouldn't get shaking in your boots when you hear somebody speaking the word muti. Um, mm. You know, people use it to refer to modern medicine, traditional medicine, etc. Mm. Um, but of course, when you talk about muti murder, you're talking about something that involves an illegal act. Yes. Um, and, and obviously the name implies with the, you know, with the death of another individual in that particular process. So the main aim of the muti murder really is to get a human body part that you're going to use either as an ingredient in some traditional potion, or you're going to use in some way that you instruct the user of the muti um, to use it in a particular way. So it can be blended with other stuff, so it's unrecognizable, or it can be in its original form, such as a hand that is used by the, 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 the client, so to speak, for whatever purposes they're instructed to use it for by the traditional healer. But typically muti, we're talking about um, herbs and <laughs> yeah. traditional medicines um historically how important as the has the inclusion of human body parts been in when it comes to traditional medicine yeah so i think definitely what we need to distinguish between our, our traditional healers who 99 percent of them are not doing this sure who are you know providing a positive role in society guiding people uh, give, like you say sometimes prescribing herbal medicines etc mm -hmm. and, and helping people and that's what yeah. the majority of traditional healers are about and in fact you know if i speak to tradi traditional healers they, they actually say to me please don't use the word traditional healer to describe the people who are doing this type of stuff okay you must refer to them as witches because what they are practicing is witchcraft and okay. witchcraft is about harming people someone's going to get hurt in, in that process of witchcraft 
But of course, then I have it on the other side. In the next lecture I'll give, I'll talk about witchcraft, and people say, oh, you don't understand traditional belief systems. So I kind of settled on on saying, you know, these are traditional healers, but they're bad ones. Yeah. Um, and that the majority of traditional healers are good ones. And we've even had traditional healers who've helped us catch some of these offenders um, and, and having committed these acts. So there have always been those traditional healers who will go and use the bad side of this to, to, mm. to you know, uh, and get involved in this type of thing. And kind of the philosophy is for every... Um, animal part that you could use in a traditional medicine. There's a human body part equivalent, which would get you what you want faster or more certainly if you want to go to that extent of using the human ingre- equivalent ingredients versus an animal equivalent ingredients or a different process to achieve whatever um, similar aim or goal it was that the client wants. So, so this is no, in no way accepted as part of the traditional. The medicinal, these are not traditional medicinal solutions recognized by any of the various tribal cultures. Or traditional societies, South Africa. societies, yeah. Now, and again, the tradition, traditional healer societies are very outspoken that this is charlatanism. It's not going to get you want. It's a load of nonsense um, and yeah. should not be seen as what traditional healers do. And I think that's a fair thing. Otherwise, it would be like saying, as ISIS, what Islam is about. Yeah. You know, or, or murders committed by in New Zealand in Christchurch, is that Christianity? So, so, you know, we have to accept that people yeah. can pervert good things uh, into their own devious reasons or motives. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't reflect upon the, the mainstream of what these things where these things come from. Yeah. Now, but now traditional healers are, are prevalent within us, within society. Yeah. So how do how do just general public, how do people that kind of find themselves in a situation where they've purchased something which there's a link back to a murder. Mm. Um, how do they not, how do they, how is that line blurred then for the, for the, for the citizen? Yeah. So, I mean, I think your average, again, your average traditional healer is not going to be involving, you know, illegal yeah. parts. Um, you know, if, if, if human body parts were to be used, the Yamutibi would be very expensive for, for, for one thing. Sure. And it's usually for things that, uh, you know, it'll be, you know, the, the robber who wants to avoid getting arrested. Um, so kind of your, your very, very powerful type of muti that you want something to happen from, from using the muti. So I don't think a person, you know, could an innocent person go to traditional healer and end up with something that in, contains human body parts without them realizing? I suppose it's possible, but uh, of the suspects that we have managed to, or the, 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 the clients or the users of the medication, that uh, the muti, uh, most did kind of have an idea that this was what they were asking for or what they were going to get did involve uh, human body parts. So I don't think you could inadvertently end up with muti okay. without that had human body parts in so it. So the traditional healers say this is witchcraft. Yeah. Witchcraft, and we talk, and then we think about rituals, and we talk uh, those types of things, mm. speaking to the speaking to the devil or mm, what have you. Mm, mm, mm. Um, but there's the question, is there a difference between ritual murder and muti murder, which implies there is a difference. Mm. Um, so muti murder, is it ritual murder? Um, no, and people, if you look at newspapers, particularly, they will mix up the terms. The headline will read ritual murder, and then it's what we would call a muti murder. Uh, the big difference is that in a muti murder scenario, the, the main aim isn't to kill someone. Mm. The main aim is to get those human body parts. Yes. In that process, usually, uh, the person dies, although we have had victims that have survived. But the main aim, the success of the act, is if that person walks away with that body part, because mm. that's what they were tasked to go and get. Whereas a ritual murder, which you got in traditional belief systems and other belief systems, is, is literally like a sacrifice of a person. So if you're going to go sacrifice something and the, per- the thing doesn't die, whether it's an animal or a human being, you, you haven't achieved your aim. Mm. So the difference with the ritual murder is you set out to end the life of a person, which could, you could be offering up that person as a sacrifice, etc. Whereas a muti murder, the aim is actually to get the body part. Yes. Um, the death is often just sort of a secondary process, a secondary event in that whole process. Okay, so we understand then that, the, that that this is not an accepted practice. I mean, I don't think we need to talk too much into the kind of historically where where the idea of utilizing human body parts. Mm-hmm. There is a question around, you know, we we live in an age where kind of of we see more and more kind of science denialism, whether it's with mm-hmm. global warming or what have you. I mean, it does beg the question, you know. If you're if you're a customer that's trying to buy these things, you know, where are you getting the sense that this is going to be um, a medicine that is actually going to achieve the goals that you want mm-hmm. to achieve? Because there's not any of that evidence. 
Again, uh, people's belief systems make them do interesting things. I mean, you can start with, you know, believing in God. Where's your scientific proof? Well, I just believe, therefore yeah. it's true. And if you grow up in a society, and, and like you said, traditional healers is a very common thing in our society. You know, yeah. we have very wealthy people who go to traditional healers for certain issues. I mean, I know lots of friends who, you know, went to private schools, studied accounting, and then get a calling to become a traditional healer. And you think, but, you know, you're educated, you're westernized, you grew up in a society, the same schools that I went into, live in the same areas. How could you? And it's just... There's just a lot of people in our country that do believe that traditional yeah. healers have certain abilities specifically to communicate with with ancestors. And it's nothing strange about that. So, yes, so somebody coming from the United States would think this is bizarre and primitive, but it's actually very common in our society for various reasons. People would go to, the, to a traditional healer as opposed to a, a priest or a domini or a or, or medical practitioner, a Western medicine, medical practitioner. I'd like to kind of look at this from the perspective of the mm. customer in the second segment where we go, if I were to now walk out of the studio and head into downtown Johannesburg, would I be able to find human muti? You know, how difficult is it? How prevalent is it, et cetera? How often do the actual, do these cases come to light? How prevalent are the crimes that, mm. that we identify that, we, that we've worked on? We're probably um, identifying it a lot less than it's actually happening. Again, we don't have great stats because we don't record something as being a mooty murder versus a intimate partner murder versus a serial murder on our crime stats. Okay. Um, it just We just record the fact that it's a murder. So again, it, you know, you find out about these things from colleagues, from newspapers, you follow up, etc. And we try to keep track of it as far as we could when I was in SAPS. Um, that we would tell people if you ever get these cases to let us know so at least we could keep some kind of a loose record of it. So I've heard, f you know, figures of anything from 15 times a year to 300 times a year, and I honestly couldn't tell you which would be a more accurate figure because, as I said, we don't, we don't typologize the crimes for crime stats purposes. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then after the break, let's talk about kind of how prevalent this is in South Africa, how prevalent it is around the world. Are there any lessons we can take from around the world? Um, tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search Profiler Africa on YouTube and please subscribe to our page. We're also available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Simply search Profiler and you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa is the handle and join our Facebook group now. South Africa, 57 people are murdered every day. On Profiler, we bring you the stories of the criminals and the people who hunt them. I am Paul Llewellyn. I am a journalist curious to reveal the stories behind serious crime on the continent. I asked the question, if I were to wander downtown, how difficult is it to actually discover, to find this world? Um, again, I mean, there are multi markets downtown in Faraday um, area in Johannesburg. Would you walk around asking for human body parts? No, but it also doesn't really work like that. So normally okay. the client would have an issue, problem, whatever it may be, that he would go see a traditional healer about. And if the traditional healer decided that human body parts was going to be necessary, they would then go and source those body parts for that particular person's problem. So you wouldn't sort of go to a market saying, listen, I'm looking for a hand. Anybody have a hand? It doesn't really work that way. It seems to be... You know, here's the, the need today because of my client's request. Go out, get it, use it, hand it over. And that's often why it's difficult to actually find the body parts afterwards because they're passed on very quickly to the person who requested the mooty requiring that human body part. Mm. So a market where you'd open up a fridge and find heads and hands, no. I mean, we've never had that. Is it possible? Maybe. But, you know, we've never had that. Okay. So it's literally on demand. Today I need it. Go out and get it. Hand it over to the client. In the lingo then of the traditional healer, you think you're going to see a traditional healer, but you're really seeing what traditional healers consider to be a witch. Yeah. And again, it's a lot of information we don't understand about this. I mean, does the person know that I'm going to this particular one? 
uh, who's going to give me something that's perhaps a bit stronger than the norm? Mm. Or is this the one that I always go to for my problems? And today my problem, he might just require, decides, requires human ingredients as opposed mm. to other ingredients. So there's a lot we don't know because these things, you know, they don't go to the same university to study these things. They don't work from the same textbooks. It's word of mouth. So again, a lot of variation from whether you studied this in Swaziland or in South Africa <clears throat> or in one of our neighboring countries or further up Africa can affect how these things would work. Let's talk then about um, your your. Let's talk about your knowledge of of this kind of medicine around the world. In the course of investigating these types of cases, have you engaged with with professionals in other parts of the world who have similar traditional practices that they come into contact with? Yeah, I would say definitely sub-Saharan Africa. This kind of concept is probably occurring in, in probably just most most countries. Okay. But when I did give this a similar presentation in France many years ago, a guy from I think Hong Kong came up to me and said, "You know, and historically in 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 sort of their environment." similar kinds of concepts about using human body parts to achieve something was part historically of their practices, whether it still continues now, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm. So this is something that I think most parts of the world, human body parts have played a role to some or greater or lesser degree of helping people achieve something, whether it's protection from an opposing tribe to mm. a personal gain for an individual, etc. Um, but I think it, it does seem that in Africa, it's, it's still relatively widely practiced how widely practiced it is in South America or in Asia, I think is perhaps lesser. But again, I, I couldn't give a 100% answer to that. Yeah. As, as an investigator, how difficult is it when you actually want to investigate this environment? Because traditional medicine, you know, your Sangoma, a lot of what they do, a lot of um, the, the belief, it, you know, it is it is not public knowledge. You know, there's a there's an air of mystery around a lot of it. So, you know, how willing to kind of, aid investigators mm. are the community when it comes to yeah. these kinds of crimes, you know, the, 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 the traditional healing community. Yeah. Look, in general, uh, these things are secretive crimes. You know, the traditional healer doesn't go into a pub and brag about yeah. this type of stuff like you might find with a hijacker or a housebreaker. We often people in the community know who the housebreakers and hijackers are. So, it's, you know, it might go unreported. You know, if the body's left outside, we have decomposition that goes quite quickly in South Africa because of our temperatures. If mm. the body's outside, predators that obviously will attack a body that's lying out in the open, specifically if there's an existing wound, that's the first thing predators like from, from rats yeah. to dogs to bigger animals will go for. And you have other crimes where there's mutilation involved, so it might not be recognized as muti mutilation as mm. opposed to some other kind. So are there commonalities when it comes, you find it, you find a, a victim, how it, how do you identify, how difficult is it to identify that this is a muti yeah. murder? So again, obviously the first concerning point would be there's a body part missing. Yeah. But again, I was called onto countless scenes in my time in SAPS where I'd say, this is a, a muti murder, you got to come out. And when you get there, even to my untrained forensic pathological eye, I could see that this was an insect, a, a predator activity from a, you know, a rat or something that sure. had eaten away the ear. It's not muti related. And of course yeah. that would be confirmed by a forensic pathologist. Okay. So Again, people's not understanding or misinterpreting it. Uh, and again, you'd pretty much want your forensic pathologist to tell you, yes, this was cut out. Yeah. This is not, um, you know, animal activity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you do, you have to consider that there might be certain police who are hesitant to investigate these things, specifically if they themselves are kind of adhering to traditional belief systems. They yeah. might fear retribution. But again, having said that, Captain Vilankulu was one of our most successful uh, multi murder investigators and unfortunately passed away a few years ago. So it's not a stock standard that, you know, a, a black policeman will not want to investigate this because, as I said, we've had incredibly successful policemen of, from these various, who believe in these things, who are catching the, these suspects. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, there's also rumors that high-ranking politicians, businessmen, civil servants are the ones using it. Could that affect the willingness of a particular detective? You know, it, it, it could. Of course. And it's not outside of the bounds of reason that that is, is the case. Do we find that these things are pretty much in isolation or have we ever come across kind of net works mm. how sophisticated is the infrastructure around the sourcing and then the delivery of what is essentially a pro becomes a product yeah. and um who are the typical role players yeah. in that in within that system yeah i think if we if you that a lot of that can be answered by looking at the various role players so okay. i mean obviously you've got what i refer to as the client you might call them the patient and this is the person who approaches the traditional healer with a particular need yeah. Might be a health issue, might be a business related issue, etc. Um, so he really just he or she goes there and 
typically they're not involved in the actual murder, and a bit of game we do get exceptions, but typically the client really is just the one that approaches, that tells the healer their problem, and comes and collects the mooty when it's ready. And again, that's also why it's difficult to convict them, even if they did know that what they're paying for would involve the death of another person, it is often difficult to prove that they knew that. Yeah. Um, then you have, of course, the main role play in a way, which is the traditional healer. Again, like I said, not part of the mainstream traditional healers. Here's the request to the client and decides, you know what, I'm going to need human ingredients for this. Um, but typically, again, they are not, in most cases, involved in the actual killing. Yeah, okay. Again, we've got exceptions to that, and some of the cases we might go into are exceptions to that rule. But let's talk about what's generally Yeah, going. so typically they are not, and what they will do is they will instruct a third party, the actual murderer, to go out and get the body parts. Now, that murderer's motive might be one of two things. Very often it's the apprentice of that traditional healer, who, and he's tasked by the traditional healer trainer to go out and get the body parts. Or in other cases, it just seems to be someone who's paid an amount of money to go out and get a particular body part. So those tend to be the two scenarios for the actual murderer. And then, of course, the third person, the fourth person in the whole scenario is the actual, um, the victims, of course, who don't benefit at all from this. Is there any kind of uh, commonality when it comes to the victims? You know, if I'm a grown man and I need to be more fertile, do I need to harvest another grown man's penis? Or is it children that are typically, you know? Well, if you if you look at the media, you'll think it's usually children that are the victims. But again, that's because those are the cases that get into the, the, the newspapers and the TV news mm. easier when it's a child victim. But in reality, the majority of the victims are actually fully grown adults, okay. you know, in their 20s to 40s, relatively healthy. So we don't find elderly people um, or sickly people okay. uh, to be the victims. And again, you can perhaps understand the, the sort of logic that you, if you want powerful muti, would you want it from a sick, ill person? No, yeah. You know, or an, older, an elderly, frail person? Yeah, no. Yeah. Another argument why I've heard why people don't choose the elderly is because they're, too, they're very close to becoming ancestors themselves and they, you know, perhaps could come back and make your life very difficult once they've passed on into the, the next sort of the next world. Yeah. Because they tend to be healthy, like I said, adults, males or females can be relatives of the actual uh, offender or, or the, the role players or complete, really? complete strangers. Yeah. So one of the cases we can, maybe can look at was a traditional healer who actually killed her own daughter um, for, for body parts. So yeah, so relatives or strangers and almost always, I would say 98% of the time, the victims are black. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about what kind of these what the doctors promise that the Muti will do in some instances. I mean, you talk about criminals, for example, using Muti to make them invisible to the police or to make them bulletproof. Mm. Um, again, which, and I understand that there's a, there's a, there's a, a an element of faith here, mm. but um, I mean, you're not going invisible and you're not becoming bulletproof. Yeah. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's like most religious promises in other religions. Yeah. If it doesn't work, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Okay. I mean, you look at these televangelists on TV, you know, I promise you this is going to happen and it doesn't, well, you didn't believe hard enough. So they kind of bring it back to your own fault while it's not working, not their fault or not the, the belief system's fault. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, a lot of businessmen who, for example, want their business to be more successful, you know, for anything from burying a human hand at the entrance to your practice or your, your business to lure the customer, to beckon mm. the customer, to take the money or to smear pro parts of the muti onto the products you're selling. Um, or one case where they, a person had a, a hair salon and it was to build, to put human body parts, pieces of it into the, the building of the walls of the salon, which would then, you know, make the business very successful. You know, fertility related issues, you know, so you might be using relate, body parts related to the genitals mm. uh, of the victim, etc. Mm. So those kinds of almost like a symbolic logic, you know, mm. the hand beckons the customer, like I said, or takes the money symbolically. So you're going to bury a hand in front of your business. Yeah. What are the key challenges that investigators face when working on these crimes? I think firstly, A, to recognize what it is. Yes. Um, you know, people don't talk about these things, so you're not going to have your informer system that could say, you know, we know that someone just bought this Ferrari that was stolen. Okay, that could be our car. So it's, it's a secrecy surrounding it. It's linking the murderer and the traditional healer and the client, and which is why our biggest successes tend to be with the person directly involved in the killing, which tends to be the murderer, uh, to prove. And again, that's all you have to prove in court is that this person caused, the, the, you know, intentionally and awfully caused the death of another person. Mm -hmm. To, to extend that to the traditional healer, you know, you have that, that usually that murderer has to testify as saying, but my instruction came from this person. Yeah. Then, you know, by that process, you could perhaps link that individual, but often they don't want to testify about the traditional healer. 
So those are the kind of challenges that, you know, very often is, is a, it can be a stranger, the victim. So again, you don't have the traditional links between the murderer and the suspect like you would have in your normal murders is anger towards this particular person. Well, who would be angry? Well, John Smith is angry with that person. Mm. Maybe John Smith is our suspect yeah. or the business deal gone wrong between two business partners. So you don't often have that if the victim is a stranger uh, in, in those cases. So that again complicates it. Um, and those type of things, you know, are probably the most two most important reasons why it's difficult for in detectives to solve these crimes. Do we have any accounts of, of what some of the key criteria are for selecting a victim? Or for selecting a, a body, to a person to... Yeah, like I said earlier, I mean, healthy individuals. Yeah. Um, again, obviously, if you need a female breasts, it's going to have to be a female. If you need a penis, it's going to have to be a male. So those are those kind of guidelines. Um, but beyond that, why this male as opposed to another male? Not really. I think often it might just be more opportunistic. You know you need a male, so let's go out and get a male. And, you know, whichever is the most convenient one to get... That's the one who's going to become the victim. For sure. As a psychologist, what are you curious mm. about when it comes mm. to Muti murder? Well, I think it's it's the, the belief system becomes a justification. And this is often why these people don't seem to be particularly remorseful about what they've done. And some that have been interviewed and, you know, anonymously by journalists that I've watched the interviews said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it again. You know, it's it's what I believe in. It's my, my belief system tells me it's OK. My belief system tells me it's right. Um, you could perhaps psychologically argue, well, must you be a psychopath then to go ahead and do this? Well, yeah. again, difficult to answer because we have people who commit mass murders and bombings, uh, mass shootings because of their belief system. Yeah. Um, so again, I think that's fun, interesting how people justify it, and perhaps in the same way that, you know, during the Second World War, you know, with the murdering of, of four million Jews, people say, well, I was, it was my instruction to do it by my commander. Exactly. So often people seem to be able to abdicate their responsibilities if they believe there's some higher justification for what they're doing um, or an instruction for what they're doing. Yeah. As we kind of advance as a society, how do we take some of the um, ideas that we've carried from cultures and traditions which do not fit into modern society? How do we make sure as a modern society that we're filtering these out of the system. And you're right, it is very difficult, especially in a country which is where, where tradition and culture is so important to people and so ingrained in but people. Even look at what happened in, was it the early 90s in, in Bosnia, you know, with those mass murders of mm. countless people because of, again, their religious differences to yeah. another group. Uh, Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis. I mean, again, massive mutilations, killings, murders, genocide, you know, so... Yes, you can say these things are primitive, but, you know, they're also happening in not such primitive societies in many yeah, instances. Yeah. I feel we find so many reasons to kill each other, <laughs> so many reasons to, uh, and often religion, culture, tradition yeah. mm -hmm. are at the center of these things. And, and, and um, phobia, et cetera, yeah. You know, as much as we want to protect the important parts, we should be more adamant about filtering out the negative parts. And, and this is certainly one of them. Um, let's talk about some case studies here. Mm. So how early in your career were you working on Muti cases and how regular in a year would, would, would a Muti case be? Yeah, I think pretty much from, from quite early on in my career in SAPS and in probably 2002 maybe was probably the first one I came across. Also around that time was, um, I think it was the week before, the week after the 9-11 attacks in the US, in the United States, you know, in the Thames River in London, they discovered a young uh, boy decapitated, etc., floating in the river, arms, I think, legs cut off. Um, and that kind of drew a lot of attention because the question was, was that a multi related killing which caused the investigators to come out of South Africa? Uh, and, of course, you know, further cases that came out uh, not, not linked to that. Mm. Um, so very early on in, in, in my career, and how many in a year? Sure, you know, not lots, maybe three or four in a year that we would be requested to advise on and other ones that we would hear about that we wouldn't necessarily get involved in. And again, we pro we maybe think that we're actually just scratching the surface yeah. of what's yeah. really going on. Yeah, because like I said, we, there's no national reporting system for multi murders or suspected multi murders. Yeah. Would you feel like there is a need to create a specific unit or a specific um, effort to root out and to mm. deal with, with, with this aspect of, tr of traditional culture or this negative aspect of traditional culture? Yes, I think it's, a, again, a t touchy subject because people might see it as you're going after, uh, after traditional healers as opposed to yes. the bad ones. 
You know, I think there's a sensitivity around that. You know, in SAPS, we did have my old unit, investigative psychology, and of course, at the occult crimes or harmful religious practice, um, people who had training courses to educate detectives on how to identify and investigate these cases. Yeah. We dealt with it on our three-week training course for detectives who came on that. And on other courses where we were guest lecturers, like the Serious and Violent Crime course, we would talk about Muti and Muti murder and how to yeah. identify it and the various things we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, and that was, of course, well received by SAPS and I, hope, and I think did help. Um, would, how do you get rid of it? <sighs> yeah, difficult question. I don't know yeah. if that's a good answer. We just start again. Yeah. <laughs> we we always be someone who's going to do it. I mean, these guys know it's illegal. It's not stopping them. Yeah. I'm going to stick with my solution where we erase culture. <laughs> we just start again. You know what I mean? So in your in your career of the cases that you worked on, I mean, what are some of the standouts? Let's talk about a first standout case. Sure. I think probably the first one, and I was actually listening to my interview of the suspect a couple of days ago, was uh, I think 2002, yeah, actually, where in Krugersdorp, a um, news became known to the police that an individual was offering to sell a human head that they had in their possession. Now, again, that's a little bit unusual because normally we have the traditional healer who instructs his you know, trainee or another person to go buy this because there's a particular need for a particular client. For sure. But here we actually had a case where a guy was making it known that he had a head to somebody want to buy it. Um, and then the police requested a traditional healer to put the word out that he's interested. And this traditional healer agreed to assist the cops. And eventually him and this potential suspect got hooked up together. And the suspect then said to the traditional healer, I'll take you to where the head is, followed by the intrepid policeman, who then, as soon as the suspect pointed out the head to the traditional healer, the, the policeman arrested the suspect. So there we had a good case where a traditional healer was helping us catch one of these guys. Okay. And this guy just thought, you know, I heard somewhere that if I can get a human head, I can sell it for a couple thousand. I think he wanted 10,000 originally. And the traditional healer in the process of acting as an interested party, I think negotiated him down to 5,000 rand for the head. And he'd really just gone and killed a homeless person and, uh, you know, cut his head off, put the word out there that he's got a head for sale. Um, so that was probably one of the first ones I got mm. involved in. Um, and again, it was nice because we had a, a, a person who was helping, you know, a traditional healer was helping the cops solve this particular case. Um, you know, another one that sort of stands out, um, case in, in Toyondo area in Lipopo, where um, a suspect had attacked a young couple who were out being private in the, out in the sort of forest. And the suspect who was instructed by the traditional healer went out and killed the man, um, cut off his genitals and incapacitated the woman. I think he probably left her for dead and cut off her, her lips um, and then took these back to his, his traditional healer boss. And word came out that this was possibly this, the, the traditional healer who was involved. And they arrested the suspect and the traditional healer and recovered the, the, the body parts. So that lady survived. The man, unfortunately, did not survive. Um, so that was just interesting that we recover the body parts because often we don't actually recover them. Um, another one that sort of stood out was uh, I mentioned Captain uh, Villancula earlier, and this was sort of 2009, where he called us out once to a, 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 the crime scene of a young girl, 12 year old, who had been found on her the, the, the compound where she stayed with her parents, with her naked, with her stomach cut open, intestines sort of hanging out, but no body parts removed. And we got there and was helping with the search of the area. And there was a little sort of separate shack uh, to the main house. And we sort of asked, but what's that? And they said, well, no, that's a, the mother's a traditional healer. Okay, stop there. After the break, we talk about how a traditional healer justifies their own daughter becoming a victim. Tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search Profiler Africa on YouTube and please subscribe to our page. We actually have some very interesting stuff coming up in the weeks to come where um, hopefully we'll be aligning with a very credible media source in South Africa and uh, partnering up with them to uh, continue to produce the series. So we'll tell you more about that in the future. Um, we're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Search Profiler. You can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and join our Facebook group now.
In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. On Profiler, we bring you the stories of the criminals and the people who hunt them. And the stories of the vast array of serious and violent crimes that we deal with as a society and that um, Gerard has had the fortunate or unfortunate pleasure of dealing with as a professional. Before the break, we were talking about um, different case studies in relation to Muti murder. And you were speaking about a case where a a young girl's body was discovered Mm -hmm. and the investigation led you back to the home of a female traditional healer. Take us from there. Yeah, so it's actually that the mother was, was the one that in the morning woke up and reported that her daughter's found outside the property, outside the house. So okay. it turns out in the end, the suspect actually reported this to the police. Okay. So we, we get there and as I said, we were looking around, we saw this little shack on the property. It was a fairly big property with the main house and then some other, other little sort of side little building. And we asked what that was and, and we were told, well, the mother's a traditional healer and that's her practice. And then we kind of said, well, have you searched that? And you could see that the guys were not keen. And I think you can understand it. You don't want to randomly just search a traditional healer's um, Mm. practice. And we said, but unfortunately, you have a a girl whose stomach has been cut open. Mother's traditional healer, you you have no choice. And we we searched it. We found presumable blood. And we said to Captain Villancudo, well, he agreed with us that, you know, you know, we have to interview this lady. And there's a very good chance that what we're dealing with here is that there's a traditional healer that killed her. In other words, the mother of this young girl. Mm. Um, so Villancudo took her back to Loate police station and we left them to do the in- in- interrogation. And probably not even five minutes down the road, uh, Captain Villancudo followed us and said the mother's confessing to having done it. Okay. And she then subsequently did a pointing out where she took an independent officer and pointed out the various locations in this whole process of her committing the crime. She sort of pointed out the knife that she used, which had the blood linked to it, uh, a container that she had put the blood in. The the only thing she really ended up taking was not a body part, but but was human blood from the victim. Is there typically any ritual involved in the way the murderer is committed? So, I mean, is the murder in any way a part of the process that would kind of make the Muti more potent or is it an important yeah. part in the in the yeah. traditional practice of gathering you know you know there don't seem to be for example incantations that they chant etc cetera, etc cetera. Sure. but one of the one of the sort of rules is that the victim should be alive when whatever body part is removed is taken and that sort of helps keep the, the, the body life essence power of the muti stronger which is why although we have had robberies from graves and and mortuaries it's not really the, the, the proper and the, the common way. So the, the victim must be alive when this is done to them. So you're saying that these so these these people are mutilated alive they're alive. Yeah. Typically. That's the, the textbook ideal scenario, yes. Wow. Um okay. <laughs> yeah. So she she yes. points it out, she she admits to it, she then points it out to an independent officer, points out the weapon it was used, which was a kitchen knife, which was kept in the kitchen again the container where she kept the blood, etc., And um, she, she did plead guilty. Uh, obviously, her husband divorced her. Um, who, okay. I think they had some other children. And really what happened was that she s- said that one day she was driving in a taxi, which in South Africa is these sort of minivans where you sort of cram 20 to 30 people into. And she overheard people talking that if you want to make yourself more successful, you need to kill a relative. Now, probably more likely is that she heard it at some point in her training, not not in a taxi. Yeah. Um, she said she hadn't been a traditional healer for very long herself. She was about 49 years old when this uh, took place, and we can put a photo of her on, on, uh, on our social media pages. And she came home and literally, and you almost imagine this, she said she, her daughter was sleeping. It was early, early hours in the morning. She picks up this 12-year-old who thinks mama's taking me to maybe her bed or something, and then goes and commits this very horror, horrific act outside. Then, as I said, according to her, she didn't really know what to take. This was what she said, but we know blood was taken and leaves her outside on the property on a pile of ground, goes back and then wakes up in inverted commas in the morning and discovers this body outside and Mm. alerts everybody. Oh, my goodness, what happened? Our daughter's dead outside. Um, Pleads guilty, got a 35 year sentence for for murder, violation of a dead body and possession of human blood. and yours, and will spend many, many years in prison for what she's done. I mean, it, it, you know, when you think, when I think about a serial killer, you know, a lot of the conversations that we've had, you talk about the fact that these guys are, are wired differently. Mm. You know, these, this is a crime which is committed by somebody who is, 
I mean, to me, it's just this kind of crime is so much worse because mm. there's not that justification for no. ordinary. There's not that rationale or that explanation mm. for it. You know, we, I think we all can understand things like jealousy, anger. So, yes. you know, although we don't condone a uh, husband killing his wife when he finds no. out she had an affair, we can kind of relate to the emotions that exactly. perhaps drove him. Yeah. And we've perhaps all felt something of that nature, hurt by a partner, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So I think, although we don't condone it, we can kind of understand maybe how that guy got to that point. Yes. Um, but this, it's, it's just so absolutely difficult. Like your cesarean kidnappings that we discussed previously, it's so, or we'll discuss, it's so difficult to understand yeah. how that person could get to that point where they would want to do it. We can't even relate to the underlying emotions very often. Yeah. Um, can you profile a Muti murderer? It is more difficult because what we have on the crime scene is not something that stems from the fantasy of the actual murderer. It's not his, you know, underlying desires and urges that he's thinking about for years and years. And he's told, go and get me that. Yeah. And that's why if you don't understand what a muti murder is and you don't know how to identify something as a muti murder, as a profiler, you would go on a very wild goose chase with this case. So if this happened in the United States, you would go on about specifically, typically because the body parts are sexual body parts, the genitals, breasts. You would go on about a sadistic serial murderer, sexually motivated which would be totally down the wrong sort of pathway and mislead yeah. the investigation um, if it was to happen in Europe or the United States, for, as an example. So here, again, it becomes very important to be able to distinguish, is this a Muti murder? And we've had cases where people have faked something to look like a Muti murder, too, with the intention of trying to mislead the police. Okay. Um, and again, we know- Elaborate. So a case um, uh, a couple of years ago, my colleague, uh, Captain Lieutenant Colonel Elmerie Myberg, attended this crime scene where she was called out by Harankua, a serious and violent crime unit when it still existed, to come out and assist because they'd found a body with a head missing, breasts, both, both breasts cut off and genitals, uh, external genitalia of the female victim uh, removed. And of course, the first concern is Muti Murder. Yeah. And then Omri is sort of applying the standard rules that we, we have when we look at these cases, which I don't want to educate any criminals, but we have certain guidelines that help us determine if a case is Muti related or not. Okay. And she applied those guidelines and she said to the, to the people at the scene, I don't think this is a Muti murder. I think someone wants to, to think it's a Muti murder. And automatically when you get staging, it's almost always someone who's very close to the victim who wants to detract attention away from them. Yeah. Because most murderers won't waste the time trying to alter a crime scene, cut up body parts, move the body, shift this, change that. Because you're wasting time when you're on the scene. And if you get discovered, how do you explain your presence? Mm. So you have to have a strong vested interest to take these post-crime steps to mislead the cops. And that usually points towards someone very known to the individual. And in that particular case, it turned out that it was actually a, a, a member of the South African Police Services, the victim, uh, a female, the female victim. And it was her boyfriend who killed her in an intimate partner sort of scenario, anger, argument, kills her, and then said that he wanted to make the police think it's a Muti murder to detract any attention away from him. And he was ultimately convicted of her murder. Have we had any cases where the, the actual killer the, the person who's charged with doing the actual murdering has been charged on multiple cases and would then be therefore be considered a serial killer. Yeah. So again, I think I spoke earlier about the Toyando case where the, the guy attacked a couple who were out you know, being intimate in the, in the forest yes. and he was linked to another murder. Okay. Uh, so yes, I think one could then argue um, specifically if you look at the current FBI definition that he is a serial murderer, yeah. multi motivated, yeah. as opposed to, say, sexually motivated like Moses Sitole. Um, but one could argue, and I would nowadays argue, that a couple of years ago I would have said, no, 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 it's not multi, uh, it's not serial murder. But I think now, yes, he is serial murder, but motivated by belief systems, traditional belief systems or multi motivation. So, yeah. yeah. One thing that for me is a takeout here, and um, we'll talk about what kind of, what your key takeouts in these kinds of crimes are, but is that... When it comes to culture and tradition, there are certain things that we need, you know, they, they should never stop being interrogated. Mm. You know, there are certain things that we need to, that should, be, that are, are, are valuable and to be kept and to be encouraged and, and sustained as a part of your society and your culture. But there are certain things that need to be stamped out. And because there's that line, people are weary to go anywhere near the good or the bad mm. and to have, um, uncomfortable conversations, um, does that hold us back? Um, I, th I think, you know, when it comes to things like where some, when people have been murdered, I think it's easier to have that conversation because most people will say, yes, we're against the murdering of someone. Sure. You know, it gets more difficult when you talk about maybe culture and patriarchal society and, you know, women don't have a say. Sure. You know, that when it starts to clash against maybe the constitutional beliefs, 
Um, then it can obviously get more touchy and difficult to have those conversations. But I think, like I said earlier, you know, even traditional healers are saying this stuff shouldn't happen. No. It's wrong. It should not be taking place. It's not proper traditional healer stuff. So yeah. I think it's an easier conversation to have. Um, would we ever get rid of it? I mean, will there always be those people who just believe that this will get them what they want? Yeah. yeah. Will there always be traditional, yeah. you know, the perverted traditional healers who will do this kind of stuff? Unfortunately, yes. But there, we can't do enough of educating people that are rooted in tradition yeah. and culture around the fact that this is not an accepted yeah. traditional or cultural practice. So if somebody's advising you, whether yeah. it's a traditional healer you've had a relationship with for years, mm. or it's somebody be, you're being advised to meet with, in no instance is this endorsed by yeah. your culture. Yeah. And so what we need to do is really get traditional healer societies regularly to speak out against this Absolutely. and the good traditional healers out there, of which there are many, to say that this will not work and public figures to say that this is not what traditional healing is about. This will not get you what you want um, by, by participating in this type of thing. That's really how we can get a change in attitude. Secondary is to obviously catch these guys and stick them in jail, which yes. might deter and the client and the murderer and the traditional healer where possible, all of those role players to say that, you know, even if you do believe it, you know what the chances are, you're going to get caught and spend the rest of your life in jail so maybe maybe that yeah. might what might, might make you want to think about not doing it just one more question is it men that are typically the customers here or is it um, a mix men and women ordering i think it's more more mm -hmm. often men again i don't have good accurate okay. stats on it but i i my, kind of my intuition would be saying it's, it's more often going to be the men what are, what are some of your particular curiosities around these crimes or particular interests around these crimes? And like I always ask, what are, what are the big takeout from this conversation yeah. today? I think for me, again, where most of my crimes that I would work on, serial murders, pedophilia, the, uh, child molestations, etc., serial rape, it's, it's that internal motive. Here it's the external motive that mm. guides it, the belief system that exists that this is okay and this is what you can do with these. So I think that's fascinating for me. Um I, I think it's the, it's what's done to the bodies, the mutilations, which for me is is, is fascinating. It's not a very common thing for, for bodies to be mutilated in criminal acts. Mm. Um, and that one can do this to your own child purely because of this external system says you can do it, not because you're angry at your child. It's not in, an argument that got out of hand. Mm. Um, you know, it's a family member in some instances. Um, and that you can be okay with that. I think those are just, again, fascinating. The people suspend the normal revulsion we would have because of this external system that's telling him it's okay. At the end of the day, it's just good old fashioned murder. Mm, exactly. So you'll go to jail that. for a very long time. You'll get a life sentence. And, and also your belief system is not going to be a mitigating factor. So to say, but this was part of a Muti system or Muti murder and it's a perversion or whatever, part of my, that is not going to count in your favor. And, and there's been court cases, state versus Mohora Medi, where the judge said, mm. you know, in the same way that in terms of uh, rape, sexual crimes, your belief system, your cultural practices, whatever they might be, were not going to be justifications for what you've done. Um, it's not going to be the same in, in a Muti murder case. That is not going to be anything that counts in your favor to mitigate your sentence. In mm. fact, it's an aggravating factor. We are governed by laws and we are guided by traditions. Yep. It's as simple as that. Gerald, thank you very much once again. Um, we'll be back again next week with more Profiler, talking about more um, weird, um, bizarre, terrifying, curious crimes. Um, next week we are talking about one that a, a crime that I've only recently even acquired an awareness takes place. Caesarean kidnapping, also known as fetal abduction we will be talking about next week so if you want to have uh, have a sense of what in the hell is that and why are people doing it tune into profiler next week tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search profiler africa on youtube and please subscribe to our page we're also available on itunes soundcloud and spotify simply search profiler you can follow us on instagram or twitter at profiler africa and join our facebook group now thanks for listening and pleasant dreams Thank you.